Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And I'm Jenna. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. You did not hear wrong. Jenna is back. She couldn't handle life without Miami Vice. Woohoo! We're famous now. I gotta get back on the bandwagon here, okay? <laughs> you better this, believe. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 5, titled Buddies. It originally premiered on November 1st, 1985. It was written by oddly named Frank Military, which... <laughs> Has wait, has, that's okay, like, like some Chuck Tingle esque. <laughs> <laughs> he also wrote the episode. Strange Little enough, Miss- he actually grew up in a very free household. <laughs> <laughs> He also wrote the episode Little Miss Dangerous, and he played Ace, one of the hooligans in Nobody Lives Forever. It was directed by, and I love this name, Harry Master George, and this is the only episode he directed. Wait, 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 wait. He was one of the quote-unquote kids uh, yes. from that episode? Yes, Frank Military played one of the kids in Nobody Lives Forever, and then wrote an episode where Crockett runs into an old military buddy. So do you think that he pitched... This episode, back then when he was playing that two-bit part that where he never spoke? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think he, he was waiting specifically for Tubbs and Crockett's hair to curl longer before they'd have an opportunity to film this episode. <laughs> Especially Tubbs. <laughs> I have feelings about that. <laughs> before we get started, I'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I bought a brand new backpack today. And I know that's not news, but I spent four hours researching a brand new backpack that I carry. Its sole purpose is for carrying my laptop. I spent four hours researching a $30 backpack. This is the world that I live in now. No decision is made without Google. Just to give you a little bit of context, I have two Amazon wish lists tracking my backpack ideas, <laughs> and I have backed out of a purchase at least once. Okay, I can't commit. <laughs> I, Don't you yep. have kids? Don't they have an extra backpack lying around that you can use? They do, but then they cry in the morning about not being able to carry their books and <laughs> dad's eating my lunch and all this other stuff. That you stole your the- last one from me. <laughs> that took and- zero seconds of research. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was in my room and then it was in your room. <laughs> Which yeah. is why. Deep in the night. <laughs> It was an expensive backpack, and I ripped off the company to get it. He stole it fair and square. He wants everyone yeah. to know about yeah, it. If right. you want it, you got to find me. I got a 2,500-mile head start. Well, guys, we have a – this is – I'm on the fence about this episode because it starts strong and strong – um, there's a decent story in there, but I think there's some there's some moments where it could have been a little bit better. I wish I would have gotten known the mob a little better, and I do appreciate getting to know Annie a little better. So let's get over and talk about this episode. All right, guys. So we start, and I wrote down like it's like a dive bar stuck in the '70s. It, it, it didn't have the '80s feel that the rest of the episode has, right? I don't. Uh, the my first thought when they walk into this place was now to the stage, cinnamon. <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought, oh, this looks like a strip club, and then I noticed there was no women in the entire place. No, no, it's all men. And this sleaze ball kind of sleaze operator guy comes walking in, <laughs> orders three shots, tells the bartender. He just became a dad that his wife's in the hospital across the street. Dad of the year right there. Your wife's still in the hospital and you've already got three shots in. <laughs> oh, yeah. He just starts getting drunk. And not like a little drunk. Like like a lot drunk. Like you just got laid off. Yeah, like just got laid off. Your dad died. Got kicked in the nuts. I kept expecting him to be like, actually, she died. <laughs> like, like he, he was drinking uh, an awful lot. We got after like seven or eight shots, in comes Crockett. And apparently they're old buddies. Figures. It, I, I felt like Crockett saw through his lies, but I don't know if that was just him seeing through his lies or Crockett's uncomfortable acting in this scene. Maybe he's just uncomfortable about hanging out in the gay club. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. <laughs> How did he know to go there? Like, there aren't cell phones at this point in time. So did his friend call him and tell him that he was going to be at the dive bar across the street? Yeah, I think that's what it's supposed to be. Like, he told him, like, meet me here so I can tell you about the baby or something, you know. Crock has got the car phone. Crock has got the car phone. He does have that giant phone. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, that's true. He just turns his crank on it. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, this guy, it's his name is... fueled. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this guy's name is Robbie, and he's he's a little off, right? He's he's really amped up. He's all over the place. He gets up, starts dancing on the pool table, and of course, it's Miami Vice. So as soon as he gets on that pool table, one of the people playing pool pulls a gun on him. I mean, you would think that getting up on the pool table is strange until you remember that he's had six shots in about five minutes. So true. Crockett pulls his gun, says Vice, but or he says Miami PD. Or something like that. And then Robbie jumped on. I was like, no, I got it. I got it under control. And then, like, karate's the gun out of the guy's (laughs) hand. And then makes him say, uncle. Basically. (laughs) She, like, has, like, a a whole flashback moment. I was getting a little worried that he was just going to go, you know, Viet Cong on him. That's what I was thinking. I thought he was going to, he was having, like, a Vietnam flashback for a minute there. Yeah, they were really trying to push the Vietnam aspect of that story right like right away he pulls out that picture that's a weird thing to do when you're having a drink with your friend pull out a picture from vietnam and be like look at remember this yeah (laughs) why did they take pictures like i want to know that why were people taking pictures in vietnam did you want to remember that were you like look at me be all sweaty and gross and we just (laughs) murdered a bunch of people but let's take a picture (laughs) what's weird like what were they they pointing at yeah i know like in the picture they're both pointing at their feet (laughs) but like why (laughs) we're wearing shoes (laughs) (laughs) look how small our feet are (laughs) robbie clearly has issues too uh, i when i first saw him do all this stuff where he like takes the gun away and he wrestles the guy to the ground he tells me we're gonna pull a gun on someone actually shoot i actually thought like man this guy's got a serious power trip he's got got some connections somewhere or he's he has a reason why there's no fear other than being a former you know formally fighting in Vietnam, it seemed like there was something behind the scenes that would make him be that way, right? Yeah, definitely. After the tussle, of course, they leave. The bartender tells him, don't ever come back to my gay bar again. <laughs> and Crockett says, we love you too. And in typical Crockett fashion, we end the scene and go to the opening credits. When we come back from the opening credits, we are at the Shelbourne Hotel. Now, I know this is this is supposed to be a mob-controlled hotel. They have a, a, a restaurant inside that has live entertainment. But at any, any point in time, did any of you, I'll ask you first, Wilson, well, so did you ever feel that this was a classy enough establishment that these people would be able to push through legalized gambling in the state of Florida? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I expected there to be like a buffet, right? Like somewhere in the back, like to have like a all you can eat steak and eggs buffet because they have the girls in the like the top hat and sequence. Oh, yeah. As the... <laughs> it's kind of like the pepper mill. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say it reminded me of the pepper mill. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. With the pink sugar. Yes, that, that's it. <laughs> we see right away, we see a woman, and I had forgotten what she looked like. We see a woman where she says she can sing, and then she does like a strip kind of number while she's singing this very terrible song, and realize <laughs> very quickly it's Noogie's wife. She is Mrs. Nougat. <laughs> 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 See, and I was all excited because I was like, oh, that means Noogie's going to be in this episode. <laughs> oh. No, no. All we get is Annie. Now, Annie's quality. Annie's a quality number three behind Izzy and Noogie, right? Um, she- I'm going to say something controversial. She's better than Noogie, okay? Oh. So- <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> See, I, was, I wasn't going to go that far. I was going to compare Annie to and Noogie to like Bridget, uh, was it Bridget Fonda and uh, Flavor Flav. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Brigitte, yeah. <laughs> Brigitte Nielsen and Flavor Flav. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's that's Brigitte true. Nielsen. Yeah, yeah. Like, you ever watch that reality show? Those two were entertaining. Yes, they were. <laughs> <laughs> we see before we get to, we see after we meet Annie, we see that she's having a conversation with uh, Dorothy, who's an employee, like a brand new employee for the restaurant. She has her baby with her, but uh, she's run from an abusive husband. That's why she's hoping that she's staying at a hotel. She's hoping that after a few days of working there, she'll be able to have enough money to go find and rent a place uh she's it's a really sad sad story it is but i was wondering the whole time i'm watching uh this with dorothy and everything i'm thinking it is that kid robbie's like how does this connect (sighs) to what i just saw in the open like like it just it didn't make any sense like at first John, I thought for sure the the exact same thing. And I, I thought, oh, okay, well, he was erratic. And now we learn that he's been this like weirdo abuser. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I pause it. Of course, we have our Miami Vice expert on staff. And so I just turned <laughs> to the Miami Vice expert. She's like, nah. Nah, that's not Robbie's. Exactly. He asked her, he goes, is that supposed to be his baby? Because she said he was eight months old. Mm-hmm. And he's like, that's sometime. I'm like, no, it's not his kid. Nope. <laughs> well, after being groped all night, then 
only dropping a tray one time she gets fired so now she's just out on the street and we see later she's just sitting in the lobby crying she has her baby she has nowhere to go she has no money what we had seen earlier and i skipped over it and i'm, I'm sorry i'll go back the restaurant that she's working in and they have live performances and so there's a comedian doing stand-up on stage it's clearly a mob place everyone in there looks like the stereotypical mobsters and it's nathan lane per- performing stand-up on stage so later in the lobby Nathan Lane comes down. He seems like a nice guy. He comes and gets Dorothy. He takes her in. Annie is watching from outside. She sees, she's like, I don't know what she's doing. She's like sneaking around in the bushes outside or <laughs> no, something. She, she was like coming up the stairs or something and she saw she's him like or going down some, the stairs or something. I don't know. Like a true crackhead. She's, she's doing gardening in the middle of the night. <laughs> I mean, anyone yes. married to Noogie, yes. that's a very Noogie thing to do, so it just, I don't even, I didn't even blink at it. I was like, oh, okay, of course she's there, hiding behind that truck or whatever she's doing. So she goes up to, we jump then to, to Nathan Lane's place. Uh, we hadn't learned his name yet, but we find out later that it's Morty Price. So listen, Morty, this is what you gotta do. You gotta take this woman upstairs, see, and then you gotta tell her. Like what Morty ends up doing here is saying, I'll take care of you. I know Mr. Kanata and Frank Doss. They're the ones that own the restaurant and the hotel. I can help you get your job back. But in exchange, I want you to have sex with me. And he just lunges at her. She wrestles him off. He, she runs back, grabs a knife. He keeps coming towards her and says, they're just going to do a little exchange. But right before that, sorry, I skipped over it. It's a really brutal attempted rape. He gets her to the ground and starts ripping her clothes off. And it's really... It's a really violent scene for network TV. And also, why are you doing this to Nathan Lane? Who would write this part for Nathan Lane? Yeah, when I think of Nathan Lane, I think of the birdcage, you know, him, that funny character he played in the birdcage. I don't think of rapist Nathan Lane. Like, <laughs> I, I, like they don't go together like, at all. Can someone place this for me in Nathan Lane's career? Like, like, is this early Nathan Lane that he needed to take the job? Or was this, like, established Nathan Lane? Because I only know Nathan Lane is, like, hilarious and lighthearted and most likely your gunkle, right? This, like, not not this, this horrible is, person. Yeah, this has got to be, like, Broadway starving actor Nathan Lane. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. would say by, based on his age in it, that it's got to be really early on because he looks really young. You've never seen him like think back to try and think of something you've seen him in where he looks that way and i would say that that's probably not that much <laughs> so if you're unsure who we're talking about nathan lane uh, as john mentioned he's pretty famous for being in the movie the birdcage he was also in the producers a broadway show with matthew broderick that had a five seven maybe even a 10 year run being one of the top broadway hits always funny always nice you imagine him making re- little miniature replacement ears for injured mice Right, that's like his kind of personality. Yeah, I want to say I, I want to say I saw him recently in an interview where he had I don't know if he had a blog for his one of his dogs or if he had written a play about one of his dogs, but he was promoting that. And it sounded hilarious. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. See. So we can all agree. Not rapist. Yeah, yeah, like not head bashing, like throw you to the ground, beat you up. Yeah. In this, right? And this was a really violent scene. She wrestles him off, gets up, she grabs a knife, he comes at her again, she stabs him. He goes down. This is more. We, this is more of a Howie Mandel part, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Howie Mandel? He should have been this guy. <laughs> he goes down to the ground, and we find out later that he's dead. She frantically looks around grabs the baby grabs a gigantic bag doesn't pay attention to what's inside of it she just puts the baby in the bag to sneak out with the baby and ru- and runs off we come back later castillo Tubbs, and crockett they're with the pd they're investigating the death and of course miami vice is always involved in everything and actually we get a question from crockett this time he asks castillo like why are we here this is a homicide should sh- should be investigating this why is vice here homicide went out to get pizza and never came back <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says that Frank Doss and Johnny Canada are the ones that own the hotel and they're tight with Morty Prince. The three of them are Morty's like a silent partner to their shenanigans, I guess. Both Canada and Doss are being investigated by the FBI. So that's why Vice is being is contributing to this investigation because there's a larger mob play in here, which may include an attempted or a murder from another gang or an internal hit from the mob. Notice how Vice is helping, but we never meet anyone from the FBI. 
did they ever call one from the to the, call the FBI? <laughs> no, they don't need them, John. They can figure it out. They can solve international mysteries without the help of any other department. In the mystery machine and uh, <laughs> with with a giant uh, Great Dane. Yeah, with a giant Great Dane. Thank you. <laughs> That's what the B team's for. While the duo is walking out, they run into Mrs. Newert and Trudy. <laughs> And Trudy tells her that tells them that she told Trudy about Dorothy that the there's this woman working there and that she has seen them leave together that night. So now we go over to the hotel that Dorothy is staying at. And Melissa, you caught this that the the hotel has a specific price four dollars an hour or four dollars a night on the sign. Oh, okay. Four dollars. I don't know. Does I hope it that that's an hour. Does it make a difference, Jenna? I think that's a night. Four dollars. Four dollars a night or four dollars an hour. Still, you're in a pretty crappy motel. <laughs> That's true, but like from a business standpoint, four dollars for a whole night—you can do a lot of things in one night. Four dollars <laughs> an hour is like you can—you get better turnover. <laughs> I don't even least. think the Motel Six has ever charged less than six dollars for a room. Still too much for our friend Dorothy, right? <laughs> she's <laughs> she's hanging on by a thread. She, there she has the baby. She still has that giant bag. She gets a knock at the door. She still has that giant bag. So there's a knock at the door. Then the door just kicks open and two men barge in they're wearing like these clear masks which really threw me off because i i was i don't know it really creeped me out when i saw these guys <laughs> <laughs> they just come barging in and say they want the papers and she doesn't know what the hell they're talking about of course crockett and tubbs show up just at the right time and there's a short shootout the men kind of shoot their way out and jump out the window dorothy runs into the bathroom closes the door crockett's talking to her through the door like hey don't worry i'm a police officer and he opens up the she, he kicks open the door and dorothy's jumped out the window and she's gone tubbs is nowhere to be found this whole time i don't know where the hell tubbs went can i ask something the the baby did the baby cry at all during this entire interaction guns going off i'm pretty Someone's sure at like, this point in the episode the baby's dead <laughs> <laughs> the baby every time they show the baby it looks like it's asleep so it's, it's almost like it's in like a, a drug induced coma for the for most of the episode yeah what did they do to this baby now i'm wondering it, it almost looks like it's now plastic. i'm getting, getting kind of worried here right <laughs> no i mean it looks it looks like a pretty real baby all the time like it's a real baby all the time mm-hmm. they have it there so now i'm like how did, what the hell did they do to this baby <laughs> Mine Crockett is doping babies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What the hell? Crockett chases Dorothy outside. She gets in her car. She peels out and drives away. So the two men that are chasing Dorothy are right behind her. He shoots at the car, but they continue to drive on. Tubbs comes running up from behind, and now they're back to square one. Dorothy has escaped, and the two men that were attacking her have escaped as well. Maybe Tubbs was held back because of his hair. Like the, it just <laughs> it slows him down. It's not as aerodynamic. Wind resistance. It's, yeah, it's it's really shocking. I was not gone that long, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like only a couple episodes and like maybe Jerry he... Curl mullet going on. It is <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> This next scene we jump over to the precinct and I, I have a long list of stuff I have to lift up here because there's a lot of detail given right in the beginning of this episode. It's, it's it's almost too much information. So we go over to the precinct and the vice team they're reviewing all the all the information that they have on Dawson. Kanata, whatever that connection is. Doss was convert- convicted of murder in 1943. So he's like a billion years old, even for being 1985. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember, I'm like, 1943? What the hell? He's old. He served 15 years in prison. Then he teamed up in 1960 in Las Vegas and and, and with just open casinos in Las Vegas and Atlantic City with Kanata. And that's where they met Morty Prince Price too. They've been arrested a bunch of times, never been convicted. They're spearheading a push to legalize gambling in the state of Florida, though. And then we get some more information on Dorothy. She fled her abusive husband in New York City. They called him, but he's got nothing. She they found out that she had called the police on her husband twice in the last six months to have him arrested. So all around we have a list of quality Americans. All over the place here. So they decide that they're going to kind of split it up. They're going to do some surveillance on the on Kanata and Doss. So Zito and Zwitek are going to stake out outside, take pictures of cars. because that's, that's what they do best, just hang out in the, in the bug van. Gita and Trudy are going to get jobs inside because they, that's what they do best, where they pretend like they're hookers. And then Tubbs and Crockett are going to go find Dorothy. <laughs> They were waitresses, <laughs> not hookers. Get it straight. Can't they be both? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, they could, but they weren't in this case. I the one know. time I had a legitimate Gina job, I wanted to take it away. <laughs> so we go back to this Shelbourne, and there's they've started to stake out the hotel restaurant, and there's this meeting going on between Doss and Kanata. So we're getting like an inside look at what's happening with this meeting. The reason why they want Dorothy is because Doss was making bets with Price. And it's got all this information that could cause problems because they've all they're always kind of in legal problems already. And then it's illegal gambling, and they're trying to legalize gambling. So Kanata is pushing hard to get to get this situation resolved, so they don't have this problem come up when they are trying to push forward for legalized gambling in Florida. Doc says he'll get it taken yeah. care of. So it's almost like this scene, like the director just uh, just went to the actors and was like, just try and act as much like a wise guy as possible just like over the top <laughs> italian like everyone's talking and their hands are all over the place and <laughs> <laughs> everyone's got chest hair and chains hanging out of their shirts <laughs> at the end of this very very italian meeting robbie shows up and he's there just to hand a check there doss wants to ask him what's to do and help them with dorothy but robbie is very adamant I don't want to know anything what you guys are working on. I don't want any part of this. Here's your money. In fact, next time I'm going to mail you a check. And then he takes off. Hey, forget about it. <laughs> and they go eat a meatball sub. <laughs> <laughs> so now we go over to the celebrity burger and we get to go see Annie again. The duo this Isn't time. Isn't it great? <laughs> Isn't it great? Miami doesn't just have hot dog stands, they have hamburger stands too. <laughs> <laughs> the duo shows up to talk to Annie to find out if she's seen Dorothy. We also see that the chef there is also her agent. She says she hasn't seen anything, but the duo lays down pretty heavy. Like, it's serious. So if you see her, let us know. We go over and we see Dorothy. She's still kind of wandering the street. She walks up to him. She steps up the hotel. She goes to a hotel that's $10 a night. She- <laughs> Steep prices. <laughs> she still has the bag that's got all the papers in it. The baby's hanging out in the bag. She has no idea. I think at this scene, though, the, the only reason why I really mentions because it's clear she doesn't really understand what she has and why they're after her no she's walking around in let's her face it, she's not that bright <laughs> <laughs> we go back to the precinct and gina comes in to a meeting with Tubbs and crockett and she has a list of people that have been doing business with dawson canada and of course that means that one of the names on this list is robbie khan which in retrospect, guys, as we find out in the end, that should have been real obvious from the very beginning, right? That his name is Robbie Khan. Yeah. In all, all these years since the army, he's been hiding the vowel at the end of Khan from, <laughs> uh, uh, from Crockett. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I just want to point out. Sonny is way too serious in this scene to be wearing that pastel blue shirt without sleeves. <laughs> you can't be upset in that. He's even got matching shoes. <laughs> yeah, and purple pants. Hey, those purple pants are amazing, okay? He looks good in those purple pants. I'm going to buy you a pair of purple pants now. <laughs> I would really, really, really feel criminals. those purple pants out. Crockett can't believe that Robbie's name is on the list. He tears through the office like, how did you find this information? And they say, oh, we got it from the BT. Team. the b team says like oh we took a picture of their car so then he grabs his jacket and he starts heading out the door to go see robbie they oh sorry he has, he has left yet sorry they show him the tape first they go show him the tape of the car pulling up and crockett is just stunned he's flabbergasted that it's robbie so then we go over that they're gonna go pay robbie a visit uh, robbie a visit i mean you think that he'd stop being shocked by now that the people close to him might have all like other parts of their lives that they're hiding from him because i feel like that's happened to him before you like his his longtime partner who was actually yeah. uh selling out the entire department I yeah mean, what we didn't even yeah. get like two episodes in before that happened yeah why are all their friends criminals like Every single one of their friends are all criminal. I mean, if he Tr- can't guess uh, any of it, it makes yeah, and that was like that way that last to week guess. too. Yeah, Trudy's friend last week was a criminal. Uh, we've seen plenty of crooked cops that are friends of uh, Crockett's and Tubbs, and is everyone they know is just bad. Maybe that's why they kill so many people. <laughs> So the duo head over to Robbie's club, and of course it's the busiest, most high-end nightclub in all of Miami. They even have to hustle their way past the doorman to be able to get inside of the club. I mean, it's with their police badge, but still, you know, they couldn't. Normally, Crockett has just the ability to walk in anywhere in Miami. Everyone seems to know him everywhere. His shirt wasn't pastel enough. <laughs> they go straight into Robbie's office. Robbie welcomes them, and I will. 
the first thing that stood out to me is like, my God, Robbie's office. <laughs> So <laughs> he literally blurted that out. He's like, oh my God, what is wrong with his office? So I thought that too, but I really want to applaud all of the offices in this because when we were back at um when we were back at the Kanata and Doss conversation that was happening in Kanata's office, he has this like gigantic art that is just like oversized ties it's like a painting <laughs> of oversized ties in the back and it, it, it's that it's that like like lime green with like highlighter green throughout style and then you go to robbie's and it's like oh so it's like a family thing <laughs> <laughs> they all decorate their offices so someone just g- yeah, gave robbie a sponge and two different colors of uh <laughs> purple and told him to just lose his mind see the only thing i was noticing like man how the heck how rude is sunny just lighten up and Robbie's office, like he owns the place, doesn't ask, doesn't ask for an ashtray, just lights the cigarette up. In the eighties, man, that was like you could. It was a. It would be rude if you weren't allowed to do that. Robbie figures out pretty fast that this isn't a personal visit, and he says, "Like, what are you guys here for? This seems. This doesn't seem like you're just coming to see me." <clears throat> and they tell him that they know he's connected to Kanata and Doss, and he comes clean. He tells them they're part owner of the club. They gave me money to get this place open. Crockett tells him though, very straight, you have to cut ties with Kanata and Doss, and then you have to give the Miami Vice any information that you have on them. And Crockett's ready to leave, but Tubbs pushes on him real hard right away. Robbie starts to break down a little bit, right, under that pressure. I mean, Tubbs is like, you know, it seems kind of funky that they would do this and maybe you're not telling us all the information. I mean, you're there a lot. You owe them money. It seems like you should have more information. See, that's because Tubbs, a real police officer, can see he's a criminal and D-Bag, who has multiple baby mamas, I still think (laughs) Dorothy's kid's his. (laughs) That's not his. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell me that Crockett is not a good police officer? I'm just saying yeah, Tubbs yes. is a better police officer procedurally. Uh, no, he's not. <laughs> are you saying that because, because he has sex with all the suspects? Okay, but Tubbs he at has least sex does with work. All of the suspects that are female. Cro- Crockett doesn't do work. People just hand him stuff, and he acts all upset about it. Well, so we are still praising Tubbs from that time he convinced Giuseppe, the hot dog dealer, to give him information. <laughs> on the warehouse where all the drugs were so <laughs> Sonny's not breaking any cases wide open okay he's just crying in a corner and then getting the team like further and further into crap and Tubbs is just trying to wade through the crap to get some real police work done so the real police work is having sex with all the suspects S- right so like when he had sex with that murderer S- and then the suspect's daughter <laughs> and then that's all the police work that Tubbs does he gets all he gets- sweaty and you have to see his I, sweaty ass I feet. agree we all suffer for that okay but we're we somehow end up better <laughs> no <laughs> after we leave the club we have the brief scene with the baptism and the telling thing from the baptism carries over to when he goes back to the precinct is that you so, see on hold on face. about the christening oh yeah about the christening so for one that was a real priest at the christening that they got mm. from a catholic church in miami which is what's funny about that too is it not only is it, it but it's a real priest but instead of filming it, it, it at his church they filmed it at someone else's church <laughs> <laughs> like, like, we want to use well, you I mean, catholics have standards okay we want to <laughs> use you but your church is kind of a piece of shit so we're gonna go <laughs> on the street <laughs> um, and then the other thing about the christening is Sonny's tie man that is so 80s that uh like purple with the bluish green like pattern it almost looked like mm-hmm. they just made his tie out of one of those like pair of hammer pants or like one of those ugly sweaters <laughs> the, Tubbs is the same way he's wearing like this coffee colored uh suit with a black shirt and then like a neon green and pink tie he looked like a car dealership <laughs> or the car salesman a used car salesman uh-huh. with that hair and that suit no <laughs> well the telling part from from the baptism and then at the precinct is that you see once he's once crockett sees the baby and he realizes that he it like sets in that he's gonna be the godfather of robbie's baby that he has to do everything he can to protect this baby and if that means forcing robbie to do the right thing and come clean with or ha- helping him get down to what's happening with Kanata and Doss and what's happening with Dorothy, then he has to do that. When we get back o- over to the precinct, he's washing his face and Tubbs comes into the, and he looks around and then comes all into the bathroom to talk to Crockett. And this, 
this setup looks suspiciously like a porn, <laughs> but it <laughs> ends up being... <laughs> I think you were hoping it was a porn. You were hoping that was the start of something really good. I thought you in here. He stands in front of the door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would make all of my Tumblr fanfiction come true, but... Hey, w- yeah. <laughs> would you make Sonny your godfather? I mean, the guy hardly sees his kid as it is. <laughs> He's got a string of godchildren everywhere. He never sees any of them. He's like a serial godfather. He never sees any of them. He just commits to it. He's like, nah, I'm done. I was just here for the baptismal cake. I'm done. We're all here for the baptismal cake. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Wait, Is there cake? I'm going to that? more of those. <laughs> yeah. Tubbs has done his homework, too. He did a background check on Robbie Kahn. He tells Crockett, drops the bomb. He's not actually a con. He's Robbie Kanata, Johnny Kanata's son. Wah, wah, wah. See, ends, it, ends in a vowel. That's how but you know he's the, Italian. But let's get this. <laughs> mafia. But let's get it straight that Tub, Tubbs did not get that information by himself, right? He true. Had to get that. That's so true. Sure. Or Gina, hey, hey. right? And then he just comes in there like, hey, I got this Sunny information. Takes a, no, he had one of the girls get it for him. Sonny takes enough credit for Trudy's stuff. <laughs> don't don't act like he doesn't do the same. Trude, oh yeah, no, he totally does Trude the same the, thing. Yeah, most Trude of Gina. The though. only one with the login. Okay, like <laughs> there's gotta be a reason that they all only ever go to her. She's no one can figure she's the out only the one password. That can remember her password. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crockett immediately grabs his stuff and he's gonna run out the door. He's gonna go talk to Robbie. He runs into as Gina's bringing in, or is it Trudy? Uh, there, Gina. Gina says, Gina. "This is this is Dorothy's." Husband. Husband and Dorothy's husband's like, I'm gonna hire a private investigator that can do real work. Give me all the information that that you have on where my wife is. And Crockett starts to rough him up like, so that you can beat her up again. And he starts to rough him up. And Castillo just comes out and drops the stare. Crockett in my office now. <laughs> and then, of course, it's like when you're like the yard duty or your mom see, sees you doing something you're not supposed to be doing. Everyone just stops. Crockett does what he's supposed to do. He goes into Marty's office and everyone's being good now. Yeah, no. Except Tubbs at the end. <laughs> Castillo kind of puts him in time out, doesn't he? Yeah, and you're right, Melissa. Tubbs, Tubbs is like, yeah, go see mom. And then when mom turns their back, he pushes the husband in, into the wall again. Yeah, like he can't see me. His, he's back's turned, so now I can beat you up. Castillo calls Crockett in because you're off. We can't have you on this morty price case anymore you know him too well and now you have this surprise so you're off the case we go over to crockett's boat and crockett is busy doing what crockett does he's getting drunk and looking at pictures of himself from high school <laughs> football pictures yeah. the glory days if only coach would have put him in he could have been somebody they, they would have gone mm. state if he would have played <laughs> Well, for the record, he did go state, and then he went to college. It wasn't for the Vietnam War. Maybe he could have played pro, remember? Uh, 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 uh. Damn Miami Vice experts. <laughs> would have never played. I have his stats written down. The Raiders are terrible. He would have never played pro. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tub shows up. He just starts dropping some truth bombs on Crockett. You can, willingly can just, didn't can, see oh, what this was. So, hold Hold on. I, I want to throw something at, as an NCIS fan. At, at least uh, Mark Harmon actually mm-hmm. played quarterback at USC. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Jethro uh, Gibbs is a better cop than Sonny. Better character, too. <laughs> yeah, he's on a terrible show, so how could that be? All Watch right, I, come get me. <laughs> Sonny, after listening to Tubbs tell him what's obvious that Crockett should have seen something come up and over the 30 years or so that he's been friends with Robbie Kanata, he should have known something was up. We have a brief stop over at a phone booth where Dorothy's calling. Man, every time Dorothy's on the screen, it's just really, really sad, right? She's on the pay phone. She's calling it, begging her dad to let her come home and then she like falls asleep. Grandma needs to use a pay phone. (laughs) 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 Grandma needs to use it, damn it. She's thinking on it. Like, come on. (laughs) <laughs> and then she like falls asleep in the phone booth and that's where annie finds her and they leave together and so Dor- dorothy's gonna go stay at annie's place what was the whole hand connecting thing because that felt very titanic to me and i'm just i don't understand it like i found you you found me like they just connect hands i guess it's supposed booth. to mean that maybe annie has more in common with dorothy without giving us the backstory you know what i mean they went uh, back to their place and made pottery together 
<laughs> right. Like it just it, it did feel a little like a a little close. I don't know. <laughs> so then we go over to Robbie's club, and Robbie's on the phone with his wife. He's saying that I love you, baby. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And then have we he turns talked to- about the who plays Robbie yet? No, we haven't. So I think we should point out that Robbie is played by James Renmar, who uh, was in. 48 Hours, Fatal Instinct. Mm. I know him from Dexter, as Dexter's, uh, played Dexter's dad on that show, who had a, who was a huge role in, in that show. Mm. We also would know him as Ajax from the movie The Warriors. See, and I missed that the first time through, and as you say it, and we're obviously, I, I think I can speak with the whole group here. We are, all of us, huge Warriors, the movie The Warriors fans. Yeah, that seems extreme. (laughs) 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 She doesn't want to commit to that. I mean, huge. Sure, for the for the family. Huge. Jenna Jenna doesn't want to come out and play. (laughs) (laughs) Fired again. You can't fire me. I quit. (laughs) Who's coming with me? I'm going to grab my fish. When Robbie turns around, he sees Crockett's there. And we have this long section where Crockett's like, you need to do what's right. And I don't know. I don't know. I kind of stopped paying attention halfway through because there was a lot of man feeling yeah. stuff. And so. I, I, I want to point out. Yeah. Of course you it, would. It, it got it got a little awkward there. And I, and the reason I want to bring up who played uh, Robbie was because James Renmore was clearly trying to win a daytime Emmy uh, <laughs> at, at the end of this. <laughs> he had the whole speech and you know trying to do his best you know can you let me slide for old time's sake kind of deal so i think i think i can sum this up pretty quickly crockett comes in and says robbie aside from us having known each other for so long you need to do what's right regardless if it's family you can't let Dorothy be killed because you're you don't want to get your feelings hurt or you want to hurt your dad or or any of that you know, you need to do what's right. On the flip side, Robbie is saying, it's my family. I can't rat out my dad. I can't I can't let, let this happen to my brand new baby and my wife and my business. Like this, if I do something about this, it's going to ruin me. Both of them have fantastic points. And I happen to side on Robbie's Absolutely. Po- po- point of view on here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he just, he mean? just he leased even a, a car. Murder a woman in her. Um. <laughs> Look, she, she got herself into this mess. I mean, okay. If she had a car, she could have driven back to her $4 a night hotel. We saw her counting that money. That was at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was at least. Uh, seriously? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Did you just like victim blame the girl and say that it was her fault that she was going to be raped so she saved herself just, by murdering no, somebody? Ro- Did you seriously just say Robbie's that? It's not fault and Robbie is right. His whole family, like, and they totally don't resolve this, okay? But like his whole family and his business and his life, everything is at risk just because he wants to be a better man about saying like that he's gonna go help her sure like yeah would it be the right thing to do to go help her if you're sunny yes but like if sunny doesn't have a a a fight in this game right like he is a cop just trying to do a cop's job robbie's trying to look out for his family the sunny's gonna get robbie killed but he didn't have his family for years right like he he dis he was already away from his family for years and he did perfectly fine so he could do that again Right. He says that, like, I got out. You, you don't do that. Well, he could do it again. All he has to do is say where she's at. It's like it's ridiculous like, that it's just one thing he has to say. He didn't have to go over there like an idiot and try oh. and save her. No, he just had to tell Sonny where she was, which is what but he already knew. And who knows if it would even got but back I, I to mean, him. You have to imagine that it likely would have. Right. And the first time that he went out, he probably didn't give up the ghost about where like someone that they were trying to murder was before leaving. He probably was just like, "Ooh, I'm like 18 and probably not going to talk to you anymore. I don't know. Yeah, it just yeah, seems well, he, risky. Well, I think he went to Vietnam. So. <laughs> he did. He did. He did. Uh, well, long story short, he does what we all do when things get awkward and creepy. He runs away. Yeah, and I will say, just to sum up this conversation here with Robbie and, and Crockett, they both have points, but Crockett's ultimate point is that if you don't do what's right now, you're never going to do what's right. If it's Dorothy this time, who's it going to be in the future? You know, you, you, you've you been hiding that you're, par- that, that you're part of this family, that you're part of the Kanata family, but it's time for you to face it head on and do the right thing. So he does have a big point there, which is ultimately what Robbie takes out of this. And he does do the right thing because everyone ends up being okay. 
in the end. To, it could have gone horribly wrong, but everyone ends up okay. Robbie says that he's going to do... He's like, ah, let me call my wife but before we take off. He agrees to both Crockett. Let's go do the right thing. Let me call my wife but, but before we head out. Crockett says, okay, fine. He takes the gun with him because during that exchange, Robbie says it might just be better if I die. And he feigns that committing suicide so crocus steps out with the gun and let him call his wife robbie runs over locks the door grabs a different gun out of a safe and takes off out through a different door which in crocus defense i didn't see there because the purple wall and the silver squares all over it was kind of dizzying and i camouflaged <laughs> into the rest of the wall <laughs> uh, i just love that that's why he painted it that way <laughs> i just love the highly unnecessary chasing that follows <laughs> what so why is Crockett chasing him? And why is his buddy driving fast? Like, don't they both want to go save the girl? Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why it ends up being in the chase. I don't but think I, that I don't think Crockett knows that he was going to go save the girl. He just thinks yeah. he's driving off, and then then I think he realizes like, oh, he must know where the girl yeah. is, and then he, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Why doesn't he keep following him though? Did he lose? He loses him. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Why like, doesn't he just go with Crockett? Like, mm-hmm. why did he want to go without Crockett? And why does Crockett step out of the room when Quit asking he, he good calls? questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he was just trying to give him privacy so he could talk to his wife. Like he said, I'm going to tell my wife everything before mm-hmm. I go. So he was just like giving him a space to do mm-hmm. it. Yeah, I guess he didn't. I didn't anticipate Robbie to run off either. I actually anticipated to hear a gunshot in the room. You know what I mean? I I anticipated him to run off because, I mean, Robbie should be a man and go and save his child. But Robbie's an (laughs) idiot. So So instead of doing that, he does some wacky ass thing and tries to go save the girl himself when he all had to do was say like, hey, he's at this hotel and then leave and then go get his kid with his money and Mm. then run away. You you never know. I mean, uh, wait, wait, you know, his his son is there with Dorothy. Yes. I'm still implying that that is Robbie's kid. So, I mean, you never know. Parents do stuff like that. They go and try and protect their kids. Crockett loses Robbie. Robbie goes straight over to Dorothy's place. He tells her, leave. Here's $1,000. Get out of here. Go, go get lost. That way no one can find you. And then, and that's ultimately, that's, that's the best thing here. Then it, it looks like Robbie didn't help her. She disappears. So it's not a problem for Doss or Kanata anymore because Robbie's going to have all the papers now. Crockett drives over to Celebrity Burger and picks up Annie. It's like, take me to your place. That way I can go stop what's happening. Then we have a very quick succession. A shootout happens at the house where Kanata's men come or Doss's men, whichever, they come to try and kill Dorothy. They start shooting into the house. Robbie does what he can to protect her. He shoots a couple people. He takes a bullet. And then out of nowhere. And then Sonny Crockett doesn't need doors. No, he just Kool Aid <laughs> right, right through the wall <laughs> into the room. It just starts dropping. Oh, bulls. yeah. <laughs> the whole He's... time, the baby isn't crying. Like, at all. No. I, yeah. No. Jenna, the baby's been dead it the whole like, episode. It has, like, paper stuffed in its mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she just zipped up that bag, and that baby's been in that bag for the entire episode. <laughs> well, Crockett basically saves Robbie's life, and Tubbs shows up at the very... It's, I have just a note, like, and Tubbs is there, too, but you don't see him do anything. <laughs> Robbie's... <laughs> And in the last scene, we see Robbie's going to live. He's going to be okay. He tells Sonny, he's like, he, I did the right thing. And this is what this is what Crockett wanted him to do. And even though there was all these re, repercussions that were possible, he a- ended up convincing Robbie to go do the right thing. And in the end, because everyone ends up surviving and who knows what's going to happen with the Kanata family, but there's no survivors of the the people, the assassins who tried to kill Dorothy, so they probably may never know. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure, you know, those reasonable mafia guys will just forget about, you know, everything that went down with Dorothy, and um, mm-hmm. everything will just be A-OK. <laughs> Nobody holds grudges when it comes to drugs and crime. <laughs> no, no, they'll no, meet no. over a meatball sandwich. It'll all be okay. Yeah, <laughs> <Get about it. laughs> Robbie's gonna yep. keep mailing those checks. Yada it's yada yada. Well, that concludes the rundown on this episode. Let's go over and talk about the music, which was kind of forgettable for me. So I'm interested to see what you came up with, John. Because I, I like last week. I'm not 100 percent sure what if there was even music in this episode. 
All right, John, what do you got for us this week? So our first song of the episode happens in the open. It's called Go For Soda by Kim Mitchell. Kim Mitchell is a Canadian musician, guitarist, and singer. He was the front band, uh, front man and guitarist for the band Met. Max Webster. That sounds like an untrustworthy band name. So, and the album, Akimbo, a logo. Yes. Um, with uh, that had the song Go For Soda on it was an uh, international hit and actually he's most well known for that particular song. Mm. It helped that it was popular popularized at the time being featured in a series of Mr. Pib commercials. <laughs> <laughs> so... S- since his glory days of Mr. Pip commercials, he did some cameo stuff. He still releases albums, and he since two thousand from two thousand four to two thousand fifteen, he was a, a radio show host in Toronto. And then in two thousand sixteen, he suffered a heart attack for which he had emergency surgery. Oh, and that was the end of the article. <laughs> and I'm still very. <laughs> I'm still like, like a cliffhanger. Yeah. Is he okay? Is he okay? <laughs> so let's all say a prayer for Kim Mitchell. <laughs> Hopefully he's not dead somewhere. <laughs> Our next song is Sweet Soul Music by Arthur Conley. It's Sweet Soul Music is Conley's biggest known hit. He's a soul singer, first recorded in 1959 as lead singer of Arthur and the Corvettes. Basically where he really broke out was in... Uh, 1964, he changed labels and released the song, I'm a Lonely Stranger. It got around to Otis Redding ended up hearing it and signed him to his label. And while working together, they eventually, in 1967, rewrote the Sam Cooke song, Yeah Man, and turned it into sweet soul music. It was a massive hit, shot straight to number two in the U.S., and debuted in the top ten across Europe. What's strange about Arthur Conley, uh, I shouldn't say strange, What what's unique about his story is that, so in 1975, he moves to London, just up and leaves the United States, and in a few years later, eventually lands down in Amsterdam and changes his name to Lee Roberts. Mm. So based on his origins, um, basically, he left the U.S. in the 70s and eventually landed in Amsterdam um, because Arthur Conley was gay. And oh. he didn't want, uh, he was hiding that secret. And so he moved to, first moved to Europe because he felt it was getting more accepted there and eventually fa- found his way to Amsterdam because apparently the Dutch are, like, <laughs> he felt like that was a cool place. Yeah. Like, the Dutch don't care. Yeah, that was the best place for him. Hmm, yeah, interesting. So, That's such an interesting so he, time period for, for because that seemed to happen so often. Not necessarily move, but live in a live in a time where that wasn't accepted, and so may, maybe not move out of the country, but just try to move, try and move and change. That way, you can move somewhere where maybe no one knows you. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, not only did he move, but he changed his name to Lee Roberts. He actually he'd eventually start performing under the name Lee Roberts, you know, and then well, until eventually he uh, he would die in two thousand three of te- intestine of gut cancer. Mm. What's crazy to think about in the eighties when it came to homosexuality and people moving around and trying to hide it, or they move somewhere where it's more accepted. You just think about. How many artists' careers were cut short, and like how much more great stuff they could have made if that wasn't if they didn't have to worry about that? Yeah, no, I mean, like maybe that song wouldn't have been the just like the highlight of his career. Maybe he would have gone on to do more stuff yeah. if he had felt more comfortable, you know, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Our next song is "Owns the Night" by Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. <laughs> Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. <laughs> so. Born Yvette Marie Stevens. So totally makes sense to change your name to, to hold on, let me get this right. Shaka Adune Adafe Hadarahi Karaf uh That's not a joke. No, seriously, that's not a joke. That's the full name change she changed the shocker when she went to shocker con john i appreciate that you took time to say like i want to i want to get the name right but i don't think it was right 
<laughs> you're just, I don't think I've been right in a million years. So, so a little bit up, Miss Stevens. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's considered the queen of funk. She began her, earlier in her, in her career. She was the front woman of the funk band Rufus. Mm-hmm. Over her career, she's won 10 Grammys, sold 70 million records, and music kind of runs in the family. She's the oldest of five children, grew up in Southside, Chicago. Her sister, Yvonne, was also a successful musician named Taka Boom. Her only brother, Mark, also formed the funk group. Why is his name Mark? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Formed the only uh, formed the <laughs> funk group Aurora. At eleven, she formed a all girl group, including her sister Aka, called the Crystal Light uh, Crystalites. And then a lot of people think that she received because her parents were involved with the Black Panthers, and she would get involved with the Black Pan- Panthers at a young age. A lot of people think that she changed her name for, to Shaka Khan because she, that was the Black Panthers that changed her name. That is not true. So she actually got the name that um, I butchered when she was 13 years old from a Yoruba Baba. Hmm. So I actually had to look that up. Apparently, so the Yoruba people are people that are from southwest Nigeria, Mm -hmm. and they speak a language called Shona, and in that language, Baba means father or wise man. Mm -hmm. So she received the name when she was 13 years old from an African wise man. And mm. not the Black Panthers. Mm. She didn't change her name to Shaka Khan until she married Hassan Khan, her on again, off again boyfriend, in 1973. So the next song, or the I will last say, song. Before you finish up, that Shaka Khan is a Hall of Fame classic artist. Like everyone loves something from Shaka Khan. Oh God, yeah. Oh yeah, just one of the most iconic artists, um, mm-hmm. and just spanned five decades. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So we're gonna end up with the last song, "No Guarantees" by the Nobodies. So the Nobodies <laughs> were a new wave punk band. Well, lived up to their name. They were Nobodies. <laughs> God, I was hoping we were going down this road. <laughs> so the nobodies don't even have a Wikipedia. You can't look them up on Wikipedia. <laughs> Not there. I had to find some off website, you know, one of those places that try and sell you the CD of whoever your biography you're reading. Uh. <laughs> and this is what the biographer did. Uh, I'm going to summarize a little bit, but this is basically what the biographer wrote. The Nobodies flirted with success when their singles, No Guarantees, appeared on Miami Vice. Side note, it also appeared in a movie by Michael Apstead called Firstborn, but that's not mentioned in this biography. <laughs> half ass biography. So, <laughs> so, they flirted with success when their single No Guarantees appeared on Vice. But aside from the song's video being heavily played in Canada and the Philippines, the Nobodies were Nobodies after Vice and were never heard from again. <laughs> yes. Ouch. That, Ouch. That's the biography. <laughs> that's the biography. So, I, I, I decided I, I was going to dig a little deeper. Because I have to, I have to know about this band that nobody knows called the Nobodies. <laughs> so the lead singer's name is Safeway Goya. <laughs> Rock to a solid start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We start with the name of a grocery store. <laughs> so his real name is Fred D. Ruffles. His brother <laughs> was the bassist <laughs> in the band. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you just say his? Did you just say his name is, is the Waffles? <laughs> Fred, <laughs> Fred, Fred D. Ruffles. The Ruffles. R A okay. F O L S. Ruffles. Yeah. Ruffles. Gotcha. <laughs> Fred the Waffles. <laughs> so Fred Ruffles. <laughs> <laughs> Old Freddy Safeway. <laughs> Safeway Ruffles. Him and his brother, him and his brother, Alex Blanc, and I don't know why they have different last names. <laughs> they started a, they started their first band, Squid, to work out, so eventually it led them to the Nobodies. <laughs> Where they would release this song, and then no one would ever, nobody would ever hear from them again. 
Well, <laughs> except Safeway, because Safeway was a- actually became an academic, graduated oh. from John Hopkins, and is now <laughs> the professor of chain? Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and is now the now the professor of Spanish at the University of Nevada, Reno. Holy shit. Alex Blanc was literally never heard from again. I couldn't find <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Safeway's doing fine. He lives in Reno. We have no idea where his brother is. So if you have information regarding Safeway Goya's brother, Alex... <laughs> Please find me on Twitter. I think I think you can send Safeway an email. It's probably like Safeway at at nev dot edu dot you know something like that. Like they probably have a an, an email pattern. They you'd be able to figure out. And shoot them a message. Hola, Professor Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> Point out before you end this segment that for John Hopkins is pretty prestigious. I think he oh, can yeah. do better than the University of Nevada Reno. <laughs> <laughs> I think Safeway is underachieving. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> he just wants dumb. to stay out of the limelight, John. He just if he had gone somewhere prestigious, more prestigious, he would have been a target and he wants to, to live in anonymity. He wants to be a nobody, Jenna. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's go over and uh, and end this. Let's go over and talk about our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, you're gonna have to wait until after Jenna to give your final thoughts. <laughs> okay, good. I don't want to be first again. I don't like being first. Put me on the spot. Do I Jenna, have some ideas. All right, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you some fodder. Okay, but um, so this for for me to to dip back in. Okay, I didn't expect so much to change. It feels very different. Uh, Marty is speaking in whole sentences now. He's not communicating <laughs> only in facial, like uh, in in stares. So I feel I like think, that's an upgrade. I think in the first season he was communicating via Morse code by blinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I can only assume that he has stopped having lunch with the with the pals. No, um, no, that's still a common occurrence. Oh, thank God. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, otherwise. Some of the the facial hair updates were a little strange, and I was really hoping to see, uh, at least we got Noogie Proxy with his wife. But I do think that it's strange that they let her, like, so after Sunny and Tubbs uh, talk with her and Trudy, her and Trudy just continue walking on into the crime scene. So (laughs) that just seems a little, I'm glad that they're still running things, you know, not quite by the book down in Miami. But overall, a pretty steady episode for me to drop back in on i don't know (laughs) i i I liked it i just wish that you know crockett was a semi-decent police officer that wasn't constantly chasing his past (laughs) oh so melissa (laughs) (laughs) so we're not going to be on the show together anymore is that what you're trying to do because you i mean you you already like shamed someone with a rape victim and then now you do that um yeah i don't know i don't think it's gonna work out i feel for dorothy i do i do i'm not trying to gerrymander no you didn't feel for her though yeah all right (laughs) she shouldn't have got nathan lane is not a trustworthy looking enough guy in this to have gone back to his place i'm just if she had a car (laughs) <laughs> okay, I think you should just stop. Just, just making just it hope, worse. Like you're digging like a giant hole. She had a whole eight dollars. Like, I'm telling you, she did. I mean, yeah, she had like ten dollars. Where did. she I would go? Gerrymander <laughs> my way through this. I will. It'll be good. <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Oh, on the episode, I can't remember anything else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I mean this is not my favorite episode I'll be honest. I think it's like it's it's not a bad episode. It's just lags mm-hmm. in the middle. It's like I feel like they tried to shove a bunch of stuff in there like look at this, look at that. Now look at that. And where it should have been more mm-hmm. detail on it, you know? Why throw that in there? And why even put the mobsters in there because literally they don't 
really touch on them at all. Like they didn't even really need them to be in the episode. They probably could have just talked about them and, you know, never showed them and it would have been the same thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not the best episode. I like it. I agree with the mobster stuff that the it wasn't necessarily unnecessary i think it just would have been better if robbie was the mobster right and then cut out this proxy like instead of it being he works for his dad like his like he he doesn't work for him he gets the money from him but he stays out of his business it would have been better if my dad was the mobster and then in the year since me and you last talked sonny my dad has died i've taken over the business and so he's like in this in between area where he's like he used to be good but he's got a family business or something like that something will Storylines would probably have been a little bit better because there's there's too many people. I had a hard time. I think it would have been better if it would have been more focused on Ravi and less about these other mobsters that are above him and how he's connected with the family, so on and so forth. It just would have been him, like may- maybe make him in charge. I did enjoy having Annie. She was a nice little comedic break, which is what Miami Vice does right before something serious happens. But I wanted more Dorothy. Her storyline was really intriguing. There was a lot of information there. And that's the theme of this whole episode for me is that there's just too much information. I couldn't keep up with like, okay, what's that guy's name? And, and wait a minute, he was, and he was in jail. And who's that guy? And what's going on here? There's just, for this one episode, there was too many things that were going on. And I wanted more Dorothy time. She had a really interesting story. She was very serious. I think it would have made, made a perfect companion for Crockett who likes to latch on to those types of characters who are downtrodden and need someone to come save them. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I'm still stuck on the nobodies. Why were they heavily played <laughs> in Canada and the Philippines? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm with Dominic through, through the whole, like, during the first part of the episode, nothing seemed to really make a ton of sense as far as, like, it felt like they had to, like, every five scenes sit down and have one of them scenes where they just, like, explain everything that's going on. Because there was just too many people and, like, they're showing us a girl with a baby and Noogie's uh, wife over here and then we've got mobsters over here and it was just like it could have been much cleaner and a lot more concise but there was just a lot of wasted wasted characters I feel like in this episode mm-hmm. why would they only be and why would they be heavily played in Canada and the Philippines <laughs> I'm getting that's gonna do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed the show and having our I guess prodigal daughter back for an episode after a few off. So <laughs> sure we all appreciate having Jenna back on the show. Uh, we hope you enjoy this episode. Please check out the website, go with the heat.com. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us, go with the heat at gmail.com, or you can go to that website, click on about us and find all the ways that you can contact us, or you can click on subscribe and find all the ways to, to listen to the show. So you can get us on Stitcher. YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, pretty much anywhere you want to listen, you can listen to this show. We really appreciate you t- taking time to listen to this episode, and we'll see y'all next week. Bye, pals! And if you know where Alex Blanc is, email me. <laughs> I am very worried, and I'm sure Safeway is worried as well. <laughs>